9.30 in Lima, Peru, and time for Coca-Cola's popular radio show. In the post-war era, the United States poured foreign aid into Europe and Asia and flooded overseas markets with American products and popular culture. Critics called it sentimental imperialism. America's economic might was backed by an awesome military power at the service of a Cold War crusade to fight communism. It was a strange mixture of good works and ruthless power politics. In 1953, a new branch of the American government called the CIA staged a covert coup in Iran to protect oil interests. In the United States, Eisenhower needed voters to support his foreign policy. Using marketing techniques learned in the campaign, his administration packaged the ruthless tactics of the Cold War as a goodwill mission for democracy. There was little truth in advertising. Fighting ends in Guatemala. These rebel troops, backed by air power, have compelled the ousting of Guatemala's pro-communist regime and have won a ceasefire from... This is the story that most Americans heard. In fact, it was raw fiction, an imaginary revolution invented by the Eisenhower administration. The truth was that the U.S. government had staged a coup of a democratically elected government to protect U.S. economic interests. There was economic imperialism done covertly under the name of democracy and anti-communism, done by the CIA with the American press kept out in a way that would make it look like it was something very different. One of the key operatives in this elaborate cover story was an ex-Marine named Phil Redinger. I was called over to the Latin American branch, and one of my friends was over there, and he said, say, we've got a job for you. And I said, what are you talking about? So we want you to uh, take over the government of Guatemala. Of course, I've been hearing about this, but I said, well, what, what do you, I, this is out of my activity. He said, well, listen, you're a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps and you could do anything. <laughs> you know that, don't you? <laughs> Nobody in the government ever thought that Guatemala was any threat to the United States. What they were the threat to was the United Fruit Company. That's the only reason, the only reason in the world. United Fruit was known as the octopus for the way it held Guatemala in its grip. The octopus controlled 40,000 jobs. It owned half the country's arable land. Almost all the country's railroad tracks belonged to United Fruit. In 1952, Guatemalan workers toiled for 50 cents a day. United Fruit reported an annual profit of $65 million, twice the total revenue of the Guatemalan government. Fifty ships, known as the Great White Fleet, hauled the bananas away to American supermarkets. They were sold under the brand name of Chiquita. The man who ran United Fruit was Sam Zamure, whose nickname was Sam the Banana Man. In 1952, Sam was not happy. A new government in Guatemala wanted some of Sam's bananas. To improve social conditions, Guatemala forced United Fruit to sell back part of its land, then gave it in parcels to 100,000 peasants. It was the brainchild of an idealistic president, Jacobo Arbenz, who thought land reform would save his country. 
he might as well have declared war on the United States. In the Eisenhower administration, the Secretary and Undersecretary of State, the head of the CIA, and the UN ambassador all had ties to the United Fruit Company. The Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, was a fanatical anti-communist who saw the Cold War as a biblical struggle between good and evil. Foster's brother, Alan Dulles, ran the CIA. It was a very convenient relationship, avoiding unnecessary debates about policy. Foster Dulles, with his own sort of Presbyterian belief in the rectitude of himself and the United States, and our way was the best, and his brother Alan Dulles, infinitely more likable, more charming, more graceful, a great flirt. He loved the parties, and it seemed to be a reassurance when he was there. The right kind of people were doing it, and they weren't going to do anything that the good people of America didn't approve of. In the matter of Guatemala, the Dulles brothers hatched a plan to topple the Arbenz government while creating a cover story to hide American involvement. What the Eisenhower administration wanted, if at all possible, was to pretend that it was the Guatemalan themselves who had done it. It's so good for propaganda. The Guatemalan people rising up against the communist tyranny. Where is the communist tyranny if the United States has to invade to overthrow Arbenz? It's much better if it is the Guatemalan people. To create the illusion of a popular uprising against Arbenz, the CIA needed to find someone to lead the newly invented rebellion. The man they cast in the role was Castillo Armas. I looked at this guy, this little guy, kind of, kind of uh, nervous little fellow, and I told him, is that the guy? And he said, yes, that's him. We're going to make him president of Guatemala. I said, oh my God, come on now, this is ridiculous. You we're going to spend all this money to put this guy as president of Guatemala? What we had, he was the only guy we had. With a leader in place, it was up to Redinger to train the rebel army. The troops mustered on a united fruit plantation. The force that went into Guatemala to, to take over was a very, very small force. It wasn't more than 20 or 30 people. I had to, uh, to help train these guys. Of course, we, we armed them, and we took them out on the firing range and, and did that. Very, very primitive training. It wasn't anything fancy at all. What we tried to do more than anything else is imbue them with, with the idea of, of taking over their country. And they, some of them were pretty excited about it. And some of them were not too excited about it at all. They didn't want to get shot. While field agents set about scripting the revolution, Alan Dulles worried about the American press coverage. He wanted good reviews and no mention of any American role. Luckily for Dulles, United Fruit had been hard at work spinning the story. United Fruit hired Ed Bernays, a public relations expert, to sell the American public on the dangers of communism in Guatemala. Bernays put together expensive junkets for the reporters. You script the tour. You invite in a dozen reporters, uh, people with not much connection, not much knowledge, no knowledge of the language or the background. And you go here, you see the good works, here's the hospital we do, let's go see a typical worker in his home. And it worked by and large. There were an awful lot of newspapers in America who weren't going to send reporters to cover Guatemala unless it was all paid for by United Fruit. So it played to the laziness of the press. When the reporters returned home, they repaid United Fruit's kindness with just the kind of stories the company wanted to see. Only one journalist bucked the official line, the New York Times correspondent in Mexico, Sidney Grusin. You only had to look. Nothing was hidden very much. You know, you could go outside the main city and see the training. You could see the troops that we had bought. You could see the old airplanes that we had given them. And there was in, there's something in the air in a town like Guatemala City when the thing is bubbling and you just know something is going to happen. Grusin wrote about the secret U.S. mission and the success of Arbenz's land reforms. Furious, Alan Dulles arranged a luncheon with an old Princeton classmate, the business manager of the New York Times. 
Julius Ox Adler goes down to see Alan Dulles, and Alan Dulles convinces him, and it doesn't take much convincing, that Sidney Grusin is something of a security risk and should be kept out of Guatemala at this critical time when the coup is about to happen. I think they either hinted or said outright that they thought I was a communist sympathizer, if not a communist. Taking the CIA at its word, the New York Times cabled Grusin and ordered him to cover the Guatemala story from Mexico City. The quiet covert assault by the head of the CIA upon the reputation and credibility of an excellent reporter and the knowledge eventually that it had been a red herring, that, that Grusin had been red baited. Um, meant that it would be less likely to be successful in the future. John Kennedy once tried to ice me out of Vietnam and you, the Times had been inoculated and, and, wouldn't, and wouldn't do it. I mean, Sydney, Sydney got moved out of a story as I did not get moved out of a story uh, eight or nine years later. On June 15, 1954, Eisenhower gave the Dulles brothers the go-ahead for the coup. Three days later, the CIA brought Castillo Armas to the staging area. We took him out to where the troops were, and I said, now, here they are, you lead them up there. <laughs> but it was really a, a pitiful force that went up there. They had a hell of a time, of course. They ran into all kind of trouble. At the very first sign of resistance from government forces, the rebel army turned tail and fled back to Honduras. Afraid the ragtag rebel army might be destroyed, the CIA ordered Castillo Armas to camp six miles inside the border and wait for further instructions. Meanwhile at the UN, U.S. Ambassador and United Fruit stockholder Henry Cabot Lodge tried to put events into perspective. Because it is certainly true that the United States has no connection whatever with what is taking place. The information available to the United States thus far strongly suggests that the situation does not involve aggression, but is a revolt of Guatemalans against Guatemalans. On June 26th, Eisenhower agreed to supply the rebels with American planes and pilots. When one pilot accidentally dropped a few bombs on neighboring Honduras, the CIA hastily wrote a cover story blaming the incident on the Arbenz government. Responsible. Reporters are flown in for a first-hand look at the results. A few small holes in the airfield caused by bombs that didn't explode. Nevertheless, their falling stirs up strong resentment in Honduras over an unwarranted air attack. In the capital city, the CIA broadcast a fictional account of the rebel advance. While the American embassy played battle sounds from huge speakers on its roof, American planes swooped past the National Palace. On June 27th, Arbenz stepped down. He realized when we started flying American planes over the city and bombing it, he knew the Americans were involved and there's no way that I can win this one. I'm sure he thought that. Meanwhile, the problems of correspondents who covered the brief revolt are graphically shown too. The situation firmly in hand, the CIA let the American media in to cover the story. And the story is good. Communism for the time being is on the run in Guatemala. Castillo Armas was installed as president, knowing he had the full support of the United States and the United Fruit Company. President Armas presents the chief executive with a presidential seal worked by nuns in the Guatemalan convent. The president, as he admires the... The president seal, was just tickled pink by the thing went. It was very inexpensive, very inexpensive. <laughs> and we, we lost none of our people and uh, lost very few of anybody. The U.S. and United Fruit were pleased with the budget price of the coup, but the ultimate cost to Guatemala was very high. A few months after the coup, seven leading labor organizers were mysteriously murdered, and all of the unions were banned. The cost for Guatemala is, one, the best government in the history of Guatemala was overthrown. 
All the reforms are eradicated. The 100,000 peasants lost their land. Then, what the United States did was to strengthen the Guatemalan army and created a Frankenstein that has ruled Guatemala together with the Guatemalan upper class ever since then, and which is responsible for the slaughter of about 150,000 Guatemalans for making of the Guatemala the worst human rights case in the hemisphere. United Fruit saw profits rise once more while Americans remained largely unaware of the secret subversion of their own democratic principles. The supply of bananas had not been interrupted. So now that you've seen where bananas come from before they reach your table, our journey to banana land has ended. We hope you enjoyed the trip. We know you like bananas. Our sins were that we crushed a very small country and in so doing we learned bad lessons which would come back to haunt us in some ways in Cuba and I think in Vietnam as well. One year after the Guatemala coup, the United States began funding an anti-communist government in South Vietnam. Back home, few Americans paid attention to Guatemala or Vietnam. There were other things to occupy their minds. In 1955, new phrases entered the American language. Automated, church key, cue card, demolition derby, rock and roll, UFO, Cleavage. That same year, the country caught Davy Crockett fever, as kids who loved the TV show bought $100 million worth of coonskin caps and fringe leather jackets. The American public would not become aware of their secret government until the 1960s, when a failed invasion of Cuba known as the Bay of Pigs and a growing involvement in Vietnam led many Americans to question whether their leaders were telling them the truth. Ironically, it would be television, the very medium that made its mark as a selling machine that would bring the horror of war into American living room. 